Hi, good day ESL students, which soon to be an ESL teachers. This video lecture is another story of love and adventure that focuses on the two main characters. They are described as Forest Nymph and the god of music, namely Daphne and Apollo. Daphne is an independent and was totally against in the idea of getting married, while Apollo is the son of Zeus and Leto. Twin sister is Artemis. He do archer with far shooting with a silver bow. So before I go deeper with the discussion, let's have a quick view of everything we need to cover in this video lecture. Initially, we have to know the context of the story, the characters, setting, symbolism, and lastly, the themes in the story. And of course, at the end of the lesson, 100% of the students with 85% level of proficiency should be able to interpret the underlying moral lesson of the story, second, recognize the different characters, and third, appreciate the new words and knowledge that can lift from the story. So alright, knowing the objectives, let's go with a quick summary of the story, watch the video comprehensively. The goddess Hera was furious since she had found out that the goddess Leto was pregnant from her husband Zeus. In rage, the goddess then forbids Leto to give birth in any place where the land was steady. Not a single land sheltered the pregnant goddess, and so she wandered for a long time, with labor pains, without actually finding a place that could lodge her. That was when she found the floating island of Delos, and, since this island was not attached to the earth, it was not subject to the prohibition of the Queen of Gods. There, Leto was able to deliver, and, much to her surprise, she gave birth to not only one, but to two children. The first one to be born was Artemis, and Apollo came right after. Apollo, handsome and blonde, was the perfect depiction of the sun, whereas Artemis had pale skin and black hair, and resembled the moon with her dark hair symbolizing the night around her. Confronted with the news of the birth of Leto's children, the goddess Hera loses her temper and decides to send the serpent Python to persecute and devour the newborn children. The goddess Leto starts to roam around the world, running away from the serpent. Once, she and her sons, who were still babies, were thirsty and found a tiny lagoon in their path. At the edge, there were some rude peasants who, yelling, prohibited the goddess and her sons to drink water from it. To prevent her from doing it, the peasants scramble to the bottom of the lagoon with their feet so that the mud will become one with the water, hampering its consumption. Choleric, Leto turns the peasants into frogs and condemns them to spend the rest of their lives crying around the lagoon. The young gods grew in size and Zeus gave them extremely powerful bows crafted for them by Hephaestus. Artemis falls in love with the offering and would dedicate her life to hunting becoming the goddess of the hunt. Apollo, with the powerful bow in his hands, can only think about one thing, bringing vengeance upon the serpent that tormented his mother for such a long time. Zeus informs his son of the place where the den of the monster is and he goes after to kill it. The beast was living in a cave near Mount Parnassus. Apollo instigates the serpent to leave its hiding spot. Python aggressively leaves this den, wanting to devour its opponent. Apollo's arrows rebounded against the rough scales that protected the serpent. The god tries to look for a weak point in the beast while dodging its dangerous lunges. Confident, the youngster launches three arrows at once with his bow. One hits Python's eye, the other at the bosom of the beast which was covered by thinner scales, thus hitting the heart. And the last one pierces the serpent's mouth and takes its last breath. Python is dead and on the top of its corpse, Apollo declares that a sacred temple in his honor will be built. That spot will later be known as the Oracle Adelphi. Apollo, using his bow, had just killed the terrifying serpent Python. The god proudly paraded himself, carrying his bow and arrows, a weapon that would become one of his symbols. The archer god crossed paths with Eros, the god of love, as he was practicing his accuracy. Despite his childish figure, he had an elegant and noble posture with the bow. Feeling jealous after seeing the god child, 
Using the Ark so majestically, Apollo decided to mess with Eros' pride. Hey boy, what do you think you're doing? Handling such a noble instrument with that carelessness. Don't you know that now, all over the world, people refer to the Ark as Apollo's weapon? Because I used it to defeat the most dreadful of monsters? Eros didn't pay attention to his provocations. He turned his back to Apollo and started to walk away. But the Solar God kept taunting him. That's right, go away. With that poor accuracy of yours, you will never do a feat like mine. That last of Apollo's insult extrapolated the patience of the god of love, who quickly faced him, picking one of his golden arrows and firing his weapon, hitting the heart of the god Apollo, who fell to his knees. Eros had never crushed any big monster, but he had just put one of the most powerful gods on his knees. His arrow didn't really hurt him physically, but now the god Apollo was under the absolute influence of love. The solar god spotted a beautiful nymph. Her name was Daphne, Peneos' daughter, a river god. Apollo immediately fell in love with her. But Eros had yet to finish his lesson. He then hit Daphne's heart with a lead arrow, making her feel disgust with Apollo. The god of light tried to get close to the nymph, who promptly moved away from him. Why are you running away from me? Can't you see I'm god Apollo? God of beauty, of music, and prophecy, Apollo proudly said. Your figure makes me sick. Don't get any closer. I prefer to give myself to one of those nauseating satyrs. However, Apollo couldn't resist the powers of passion and tried to get closer to the nymph. She tried to run away, but Apollo kept chasing her. When the god was about to catch her, the nymph ran into the waters of her father's river, Peneos the God River, who decided to help his daughter. Right when Apollo grabbed her, Daphne started to transform herself into a tree. Apollo, desolated, kissed the tree, and when he tried to touch the nymph's hair, he was left with laurel leaves in his hands. Daphne had been transformed into a laurel. Already resigned, Apollo said, I was denied the chance to love her, but from now on, you will be my sacred plant. From your leaves I'll make a laurel wreath, which I'll wear, and I'll allow it to be worn by those who are living a moment of triumph. And from that day forward, the laurel wreath became a symbol of glory. Hyacinth was a young man of great beauty, his beauty was so immense that he even attracted two deities. One of them was Apollo, the god of music and prophecies. The other was Zephyrus, also known as the West Wind. Hyacinth was amused by Zephyrus. He flied across the sky alongside the god, piercing the clouds. With Apollo, the youngster rejoiced with the songs played by the brilliant god. The boy and the god became quite intimate. Hyacinth spent his days beside the god of music, doing all sorts of things. Realizing that he had been left out, Zephyrus started to nurture a great grief in his heart. One day, Apollo and Hyacinth decided to throw the discus. After preparing himself to throw it, Apollo launched the disc with incredible strength. The disc reached a stunning height. Hyacinth was ready to catch it, which descended at high speed. But the jealous Zephyrus blew the disc away, suddenly changing its trajectory. The disc fell to the ground, and after the rebound, hit Hyacinth's head with violence. Apollo ran to rescue the boy whom he treasured so much. The god tried to use his powers to save Hyacinth's life, but not even the mighty Apollo could change Hyacinth's fate, traced by the Mori. The beautiful boy died in Apollo's arms. Beautiful flowers start to sprout where the Hyacinth's blood drops fell. Apollo felt guilty for ending Hyacinth's life at the peak of his youth, and in tribute to his friend, the god wrote his most beautiful songs, which were also the saddest and most melancholic. But with the arrival of spring, the god rejoiced, because the beautiful flowers born of the young's blood reappeared, and these came to be known by the name of Hyacinth. Pan, the god of the woods, had always been a divinity neglected by his peers. 
Nonetheless, after inventing the pan flute, his musical talent was about to flourish and the god began to be followed and respected wherever he was. Pan used to wander through the woods and fields with his new friend, King Midas. The latter was known for his ability to transform into gold everything he touched, but his talent proved to be a true curse. However, after having his golden touch removed by Dionysus, Midas started to repudiate the vile metal and lived a simple life in the woods. He met Pan there and both became great friends. The ego of the god of the woods started to grow with each praise he got for those who listened to his songs. Pan started to believe that he was the greatest musician who had ever lived and bragged about it. Even Apollo's lyre is obscured by the magnificent sound of my flute. Since he is so incredible, why doesn't he challenge me to a musical duel? My friend, posing such a challenge to Apollo is not wise. After all, he is the god of music. Which side are you on? You know we are friends. I support you. Pan's challenge reached the ears of Apollo, who promptly accepted it and departed to the location where the clash was scheduled to take place. So are you the one who has been spreading rumors that you can defeat the god of music in a duel? The god of music? The sun god? The god of philosophy? You have accumulated many roles, but I will unburden you from one of those. You would not even be able to defeat Orpheus, my mortal son, let alone the great Apollo. The gods, nymphs, and other creatures of the forest gathered to listen to what would be the greatest musical clash ever. Pan grabbed his flute and began his performance. His ability was remarkable. The melody thrilled all of those who heard him. The god of the woods ended his music and was congratulated with a standing ovation. He would hardly be defeated. But the god Apollo was not impressed and, after tuning his lyre, started to perform his music. The chords of the god were beautiful. The harmony was an absolute. No other sound could be more divine. The gods yelled, Bravo! The eyes of the nymphs dropped tears of emotion. His victory appeared obvious. The Olympians indicated Apollo as the winner. The nymphs and fauns, despite having enjoyed both of them, also chose the sun god. It was time for Midas to give his victor. He looked at his friend, and he uttered his voting. Today, Apollo has moved everyone to his music. But Pan's flute was nothing less than perfect. So, I declare Pan as the superior one. Midas knew that Apollo had already won the contest, and so he decided to cast a vote of consolation to his friend. But he did not expect Apollo's reaction, who wanted to humiliate Pan with a unanimous win. The god approached Midas and said, You appear to be interested in music, but I believe your ears do not seem to help you. But I can solve that. Apollo replaced the ears of Midas with donkey ears. There you go. With these brand new ears, anyone will recognize you as the great music critic you are. As you've watched from the video, the story all started with Apollo insulted the young Eros, also known as Cupid, because of Eros playing with bow and arrows. So the insulted Eros took two arrows, one of gold and one of lead, with the leaden shaft to incite hatred. He shot the nymph Daphne and with the golden one to incite love. He shot Apollo through the heart. So which bound to play with Daphne and Apollo to one incited of hatred and the other full of love? Having said that, Daphne was a Thessalian river naiad nymph of the legend of Arcadia or the Peneus. The god Apollo loved her who pursued her until she grew tired and cried to Gaia for support. The goddess became a laurel tree and was then adopted by Apollo as its sacred plant. 
Let us now know the context of the story. It is a goodie but an oldie. For thousands of years, the Greek myth of Apollo and Daphne has been said and retold. The story of the Roman poet Ovid, which is used in his metamorphosis, is perhaps the most famous but far from being the only one. Because as I've told you from the previous video lecture, there's always different versions of the story which altered some information into somewhat far from the other version. So aside from Ovider, this author such as Petrarch, Garcic Lasso, Quebado, and many others all put their own spin on the story. And many great authors including Byron and Shakespeare have often referred to the story in the novel. So whether you have read different titles, think of it as another way of telling the story. And enough of that, let's move on to the characters. So first is a Apollo. Doom in love but Apollo isn't having luck with the ladies. Although he is a great god with much strength, he has no game. His story with Daphne which is probably the most famous story of his nymph love but still there are many other tales of Apollo's doom love affairs like his story with Castalia. She is another nymph and daughter of a river god fell in love with him but she ran away and sunk into a stream. Also, Apollo has fell in love with Troy's deadly wife, Cassandra. Unlike the female lovers, Apollo often had male lovers but also had a bad, bad luck with male lovers. Our second character is Daphne. Daphne is a pretty young nymph and the river god Peneus' daughter. She runs into some fairly bad luck when she gets trapped in a spot between Cupid and Apollo. She was being heated by the lead tripped arrow. Daphne tells her father she wants to be a virgin forever and ride freely through the woods like the Artemis goddess and this was the effect of the lead trip arrow which has incited of hatred. So Apollo relentlessly chases her around the woods. Daphne begs for help from her father so he turns her into a laurel tree. She does get her wish in a way. Daphne remains a virgin forever and always gets to hang out in the woods. Of course, she doesn't really get to do a lot of running plus she is a tree. And Daphne is also getting this contract bomb done. She has done nothing wrong. Really. Class. Daphne done nothing wrong because she was just hanging out looking after her own business and doing whatever the nymphs do all day but when Cupid and Apollo came along at the end of the novel Apollo is making the laurel its holy tree in Daphne's memory we need to question how much this is an honor we can say that she went to a root bound tree from a free willing nymph that has to suck you may see Daphne as an innocent victim of a culture that is dominated by men. Our third character of the story is Cupid, also creates trouble. He is the god of desire and it is never easy. In Greek mythology, almost always a sting from the arrow of Cupid means that something terrible will happen like very soon. Like in the Apollo and Daphne, till we see Cupid use his forces to take vengeance on Apollo. We should just about sympathize with Cupid here. After all at the beginning of the story, Apollo is to him a, a total jerk. So Cupid though seems for no apparent reason to include Daphne in his joke except that she was only conveniently around. So this makes Cupid look a little bit carelessly cruel. So lastly, Peneus, he is a river god and father of the young nymph Daphne. When she first tells him that she doesn't want to ever get married, he's not really that big on her plan. However, he gives into her wish, so he comes across as a pretty easygoing dude. Later on, Daphne begs him to save her from Apollo and Peneus turns his daughter into a laurel tree. We're not quite sure why this is the solution that lives into his mind but it works for ancient Greeks and it works for us. So now the setting of the story. As you can notice, setting doesn't play a big part in the Apollo and Daphne myth. We know that Apollo has been chasing Daphne around for a while but we don't know exactly where it's going to happen. There it is Apollo killed the giant python hanging around the oracle of Delphi at the base of Mount Parnassus at the very beginning of the story that happened. And we're thinking that the action with Daphne plays out nearby somewhere. If that's the 
case, then it's somehow ironic that Cupid gets won over an Apollo so close to Delphi. It was the location where Apollo reportedly put out the future prophecies. So alright, second to the last topic is the symbolism found in the story. The first fine trees, the Apollo and Daphne meet, explains where the laurel tree originated. Some cultures also have legend that describe the roots of certain kinds of trees. Next is the Venus and Adonis. This was being compared because Venus loves a human man by the name of Adonis in the legend of Venus and Adonis. She transformed him into a plora when he is killed in a hunting accident called an animoon. However, Daphne willingly turned herself into a laurel tree. And lastly, Cupid's arrow. We could say that the arrows themselves represent love. Also in novels, Cupid's arrows strike completely out of the blue and they trigger lots of trouble almost always. Just like how Cupid struck hatred towards Daphne. And now down to the last topic, the themes. First is love. It was being debated whether we should label this theme as lust or rather than love because Apollo doesn't seem to be exactly in love with Daphne when Cupid's golden arrow nails Apollo, causing him to fall for Daphne. This god of reason instead seems overwhelmed by irrational, overpowering, erotic desire. So after all, Cupid was the god of desire, not love, because love that was his mother's job, it's Aphrodite, also known as Venus. And next is transformation. Daphne's father turns the young nymph into a laurel tree at the end of the novel. And also, we can see that on heart's issues in the story center, Apollo falls head over heels for the young nymph thanks to cupid gold trip arrow and that is all with the story of apollo and daphne thank you for listening